Decades after his death, Magic fans and plebes alike are fascinated by the life of one of the world's greatest entertainers, Harry Houdini. Born Eric Weiss in Hungary, Houdini made a career out of doing weird sh** and getting paid for it before people knew that was a thing he could do. Here are some of Harry Houdini's exploits. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and leave some comments. Ah, magic! All right, let the show begin. Harry had a long affair with film, a relationship too deep and passionate to be a fling, but not as committed as a marriage. He starred in two Hollywood pictures, produced and starred in two more films in New York, and founded a film lab before turning his back on the industry. In The Master Mystery, Houdini played Quentin Locke, a Justice Department agent who got into a fistfight with Q the Automaton. Houdini was like the 20s version of Kyle Reese. If you were a cop in turn-of-the-century New York City, the last thing you wanted was Harry Houdini publishing a book explaining how to slip out of handcuffs, escape prison, and all manner of other illegal-ass In 1906, Houdini released The Right Way to Do Wrong, which detailed his criminal exploits, such as breaking out of a police station. To make sure readers didn't misconstrue the purpose of his book, Houdini included this message. It does not pay to lead a dishonest life. And those who read this book, although it will inform them the right way to do wrong, all I have to say is one word, and that is don't. In 1895, when Keaton was six months old and named Joseph Frank Keaton, he fell down a flight of stairs in his family home. Houdini happened to be hanging out with the Keaton family that night, who were all vaudeville performers, and picked up Baby Buster, who was completely fine, despite his tumble down the steps. Understandably impressed, Houdini remarked Keaton could really take a Buster. And from then on, the future film star was known as Buster Keaton. In 1909, he really got into aviation and bought a French Voisin biplane for $5,000 he hired a mechanic and taught himself how to fly. After a minor crash, Houdini dusted himself off and flew over Germany for a few minutes, watched by about a hundred gaping German spectators. Look, up in the skies, it's Harry Houdini's. A year later, he became the first person to fly over Australian soil, where he buzzed around for almost eight whole minutes. Crikey! He filmed that flight, and in doing so became the first person to ever be recorded flying. After that, Houdini put the plane in storage in England and never flew again. Of all the magic tricks and feats of endurance Houdini performed, he must have really liked burying himself alive, because even though he failed, <clears throat> I mean almost killed himself, on his first attempt to do so in front of a group in 1915, he kept trying to do it. Houdini was absolutely fascinated with the idea of being buried alive before an audience. After his first attempt, he was chained in a coffin and submerged in a swimming pool where he stayed for 90 minutes. The coffin was watertight. He used controlled breathing to avoid suffocation. This was done quite publicly in New York City and apparently done again a few months later in Worcester, Massachusetts. Still, that wasn't good enough for Houdini, so he devised a way to be buried alive on stage using a glass vault and glass coffin so the audience could see everything until he was completely covered in a ton of sand. According to the common narrative, he was going to perform this escape in 1926, but died before he could. However, a letter unearthed in 2014, allegedly written by Houdini to fellow magician James S. Harto, attests he performed the feat in September of 1926 under the name Mystery of the Sphinx. You've probably heard that Houdini was punched to death. That's not entirely accurate. See. Houdini had a weird thing about getting people to punch him as hard as they could, and in 1926, he was punched one time too many by a man named J. Gordon Whitehead, whose fault this most certainly is not. But Harry didn't just keel over and die. The story goes something like this. Whitehead approached Houdini, asking for permission to punch him, as Houdini claimed, hitherto correctly, that his abs could withstand any fist. Whitehead got permission and gut-hammered Houdini, who was in a reclined position before he could prepare for the hit. Oh, that's gonna leave a mark. Despite excruciating pain, Houdini went ahead with his show that night. Houdini was already running a fever and had a broken ankle, so he probably figured, What the hell? 
The next day, Houdini was in awful condition. A physician examined him before a performance and told him he had acute appendicitis that required immediate surgery, but Houdini said, nah. After the show, he went to the hospital, where he had his appendix removed. It had burst by the time he finally sought treatment, likely helped along by Whitehead's knuckles. Houdini died one week later. When World War I broke out, Houdini didn't lock himself up in a milk jug until the battles ended. Instead, he decided to stump for the military. He helped sell war bonds and went to Europe to show American soldiers how to escape German handcuffs. On the home front, Houdini performed reviews to boost morale, including one called Cheer Up, and another during which he pulled an eagle named Abraham Lincoln from an American flag. Everyone has some kind of personal goal in life. Houdini's was traveling around the U.S. debunking mediums who insisted they could contact people in the afterlife. He went so far as to cancel shows in order to put mediums on blast who he felt were taking advantage of people. He sometimes brought the editor of Scientific America and a panel of scientists with him to publicize the fraudulent psychics. And why? For the same reason Fox Mulder works The X-Files. He wanted to believe. He wanted to find the genuine article, Proof of Life After Death, the ultimate escape trick. In 1924, Houdini traveled to Boston to meet Mina Marjorie Crandon and prove she was full of shit. Crandon, a beautiful and charming woman, made a name for herself channeling the spirit of her brother, a crass jackass who threw random objects at people, including a megaphone, for whatever reason, spoke in a thundering voice, and was allegedly able to pass on messages from the dead. In post-World War I, post-Spanish flu epidemic America, many, including Houdini, yearned to talk to departed loved ones. The day of the seance, Houdini tightly bandaged one of his legs to make his skin especially sensitive. He suspected he, as a guest of honor, would be seated next to Crandon and hoped he could use his leg to feel the movements of her body in order to figure out how she was hoodwinking people. The move paid off as Houdini, in the dark of the seance, felt Crandon using her leg to pull objects from under her chair to wing them around the room, a ploy to convince customers a ghost was among them. Houdini went to a second seance Marjorie held and caught her levitating a table by wearing it on her head. Later, when describing her malarkey, he said it was the slickest ruse I've ever detected. If you were doing weird stuff in the early 20th century, things like wearing a straitjacket underwater or writing about barbarians fighting snake gods, you kind of had to associate with H.P. Lovecraft, the spookiest, flame war lovingest writer in America. Turns out at least one manuscript on spiritualism Houdini made available to audiences at his shows was ghost-written by Lovecraft, or sort of. In 1926, Houdini commissioned Lovecraft to write The Cancer of Superstition, a 31-page piece tracing superstition through the ages. As a genuine proto-troll, Lovecraft didn't write most of the manuscript, but instead farmed it out to buddy C.M. Eddy. He pulled stuff like that all the time. His literary peers either loved him or hated him. Either way, he was always first to throw shade. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of Sherlock Holmes, was really into magic and spiritualism. So much so, he broke up his bromance with Houdini when the latter started busting up seances in the early 1920s. Before the relationship fell apart, the two were so close they went on vacations together. Doyle had always believed in spiritualism, but after his eldest son passed away, his interest in the occult became a full-on obsession. His wife was a self-proclaimed medium. When Houdini exposed crackpot fake psychic Marjorie Crandon as a fraud, the author took personal offense and unfriended him the old-fashioned way by telling the newspapers. Houdini lashed back, and the once great friends engaged in a press feud. And we bet Lovecraft was just laughing it up over his cereal the whole time. To be fair, Houdini probably had a lot of enemies in the magic community, but there was one guy he was at odds with for most of his career. Howard Thurston, Houdini's nemesis, wasn't just performing a parallel magic, he was also trained by the same guy who trained Houdini, Harry Keller. Keller picked Thurston over Houdini to carry on his legacy as the most magical man in the world. So what? thought Houdini. Did Thurston almost drown himself to make people forget they spent their hard-earned money to watch a guy lie to them? Nuh-uh. So why? Here's the thing. Houdini apparently wasn't much of a magician or a showman, whereas Thurston was a fantastic entertainer and extremely talented magician. At least so says Jim Steinmeier, author of the tellingly titled The Last Great Magician in the World. 
Thurston's showmanship and ability to levitate a woman in midair during an extravagant two-and-a-half-hour show is what earned him Keller's blessing. So why is Houdini the one the world remembers years later? In part, because he successfully vanished an elephant in front of thousands. And also because he risked killing himself every night in the name of entertainment. Houdini was one of the most famous men of his time. He had a lot of admirers and more than a few haters. Like a lot of high-volume celebrities, he didn't want to talk to most of the people who wanted to talk to him. But instead of just ignoring those who wanted his ear, he sent notes informing the recipient that he was working and didn't have time to deal with their shenanigans. His default response to those who wished to speak to him before a show read, The note has been rushed to you under the stress of business and written in the dressing room. So yeah, Houdini was in the building, but you weren't going to be able to talk to him. He mastered the art of escaping awkward conversations. If you're going to be a willing part of something as decadently nerdy as the Society of American Magicians, you definitely want to be president. Houdini joined the society in 1903 and was made president in 1917. He held that position until his death in 1926. I mean, who was ever going to try and take it from him alive? Howard Thurston, Houdini's more talented and less famous nemesis, served as vice president of the organization during Houdini's presidency and as president from 1927 to 29, a far shorter span than Houdini's nine-year tenure. But having been the most magical man in the world probably made up for it. What do you think of Houdini? Let us know in the comments below and check out some of these other videos of our weird history. Subscribe to Weird History. So says Houdini.